The Tale of the Man of Ivy Once upon a time, in a land both far from this one and very near, because sometimes distant places are closer than you think and more similar too, lived a man named Jacob. He owned a small farm but dreamed of owning a larger one. He was married to a pretty wife but secretly yearned to be married to a more beautiful one. He had a scholarly, amiable son but would have preferred a strong, forceful one. These desires Jacob kept to himself because although he might have been driven by longing for all he did not have, or thought he did not have, because desire is a blinding emotion, he was not a malicious man and had no wish to hurt his family. Only when he was alone in the woods with no one to hear would he permit his frustrations to show and then he would give vent to his true feelings, speaking aloud of them to bark, branch and blade. One autumn day, when he had spent an hour telling nature of his longings, he heard a voice call his name. He looked around him, but the forest clearing was empty, for not even a bird hovered, nor did the tiniest of insects trouble the dirt. Who's there? said Jacob. Stop hiding and show yourself. Look closer, said the voice, and then you will see. Look to the trees. And Jacob did, as the voice told him, first gazing up at the crowns, then peering behind their trunks, until finally he came to an old sessile oak, its bark overgrown with thick ivy. And there, in the heart of the greenery, he saw a face formed by the arrangement of the fronds. It had only darkness for eyes and a hole for a mouth, yet a face it undoubtedly was, though it would have been easy for someone to miss it had they not been searching for it. As Jacob watched, the fronds at the mouth moved, and the boy spoke again, a dry whisper, a rustle, like dead leaves driven before the breeze. I was not hiding, said the voice. It is one thing to hide, another not to be noticed. Who are you, said Jacob? What are you? I suppose one might term me a spirit, one might even refer to me as a god. But how are you called, said Jacob? Oh, I have many names, some of which have never been spoken aloud by men. Today for you, let me be called Beonot. Beonot it is then, said Jacob, even as he thought that the name was a curious one, for it referred to a place of bent grass, of crooked greenery. But then this was a curious creature, whatever it might be. How long have you been there? Jacob asked. Long enough to have listened to your complaints, said Bayonot, and not just on this day, but all the days gone by, long enough to feel pity for your plight. Pity, said Jacob. You deserve better, said Bayonot, but that's true of many people. What makes it harder for you is that you know you deserve better. A different, richer life is almost within your grasp. If it were granted you, I have no doubt that you would cherish it and value your time on earth all the more. You would no longer waste time pining for what you did not have, because all that you wished for would be yours. You would be content, would you not? I would, said Jacob. The land I farm is good land, but there could be more of it. My wife loves me, but the years, I fear, are not being kind to her. My son is liked by all and is a tender soul, but this is not a tender world, and strength will take him further. So what would you have me do, said Bayonot, if it were in my power to change things for you? You would give to me my neighbour's land, said Jacob, that I might grow more crops and raise more cattle, but not so many acres as to make its stewardship a strain. You would make my wife beautiful once more, but if that were not possible, you would provide me with another who was so, but who loved me just as the old life does. Nevertheless, I would not wish her to be so beautiful that other men might covet her and would ask that you provide her with a faithful disposition, just in case. And you would take some of my son's kindliness and replace it with a robustness of body and will, but not so much as to cause him to reject me in my old age. And then would you be content, said Bayonot? Then I would be content, said Jacob. And as he spoke, Jacob believed all he said, but only because he had long before convinced himself of the truth of it. Thus can a man become a liar while holding himself honest. But what of your neighbour, said Bayonot, does he too not value his land 
What will become of him if I bequeath his acres to you? I leave that to you, said Jacob, but I wish him no loss. And your wife, what is she to do if another takes her place? I leave that to you, said Jacob, but I wish her only happiness. And your son, should I make him forget his old self? What if he is content as he is? I leave that to you, said Jacob, but I wish him only to be better equipped to face the harshness of life. By now the sun was setting, and it cast a golden glow over Bayonot amid the ivy, so that he seemed to be aflame. And had Jacob not been so enthralled to his own cravings, so bedazzled by the prospect of a better future, he might have perceived that the face of Bayonot was not a benign one, that Bayonot's features were twisted, that Bayonot's mouth was a misshapen scar, and that the concavities of Bayonot's eyes were black, far blacker than any shadows alone should have caused them to appear. Let us be honest with each other, said Bayonot. What you desire is a life that is not the one you have, because it strikes me that you would be most happy if you could leave your old life behind, shedding it like a skin. Yes, said Jacob, with a confidence he had never felt before. I wish to shed my old life, shed it like a skin. That I ask that you seal our bargain with blood, said Bayonot to show that I have not misjudged the depth of your commitment. Let it drop into my mouth, for I cannot see what you are doing, and only by taste can I confirm that we are agreed. So Jacob took his hunting knife, and with the tip he pricked a finger, so that a single droplet of blood fell into Bayonot's mouth. At that instant all the leaves on the tree turned from green to pink, then red and the ivy became flesh, and from the deadwood trunk there emerged a bent, skinless figure, even as the blood continued to drip from Jacob's finger faster and faster, so that the drops became a stream, and the stream became a torrent, until finally nothing remained of Jacob but his skin and clothes. The crooked man stretched his cramped limbs, and blood stained the dirt, hissing and smoking as it landed. He picked up Jacob's skin, and fitted it to his body, so that he became the image of the dead farmer. The crooked man, you see, was very old, and very old things may seek to make themselves look young again, for even the worst of us have our vanities. Eventually, the crooked man knew, his own essence would contaminate Jacob's, and he would once again resemble his former self, a gnarled, warped being, although encased in a fresh suit of skin that might last him for many years. But while he favoured the dead man, he thought he might take advantage of the fact. So the crooked man dressed himself in Jacob's clothing and prepared to make the acquaintance of his new wife. <laughs>